Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Katz, and I'm the president of the Washington Map Society. And uh, welcome to this evening's program, which is hosted by the partnership of eight map societies representing all parts of the country. Boston, California, Chicago, New York, Rocky Mountain, Texas, Washington Map Society, as well as the Library of Congress's Philip Lee Phillips Society. These map societies are nonprofit organizations that support map collecting, cartography, and the study of cartographic history. These groups also supply financial support for this Zoom meeting. If you are not a member, we hope you will consider joining at least one map society. Please see the chat for links to each of the map society's websites. The benefits vary for each society. For example, members of the Washington Map Society receive three annual issues of the Portalon Journal, digital access to all past issues of the Portalon, digital access to past guest speaker lectures, and many other features in the members only section of the WMS website. If you are not a member, the WMS has an introductory rate of $25 for the first year of digital membership. I know many of you have already heard this, but I'm repeating it. Uh, we and our partner map societies would like to thank our advertisers. Uh, John, we might show them on the screen. They support our groups and also help make possible the publication of our journals, the Portal On and the Calafia, the Journal of the California Map Society. Now, before we proceed further with tonight's program, there are several requests for this Zoom presentation. Please mute your microphone during the lecture. Me in here. And wait until the Q&A period at the end to ask questions. Please note that this lecture will be recorded. Actually, it's uh, already started to be recorded. So please turn off your video and microphone if you do not want to be recorded. After the Q&A period, we will leave the meeting open for attendees to socialize if they wish, at which point you turn your microphone on. Now, ordinarily at this point of the program, you would hear from Ron Grimm, our program chair. Unfortunately, he has a conflict. He's attending another meeting. Uh, up in Boston, and I will also take it from here. So I would like to show you our future meetings. Um, we have developed a schedule of monthly Zoom meetings from September to January, which are listed in the most recent issue of the Portal On. And in consultation with the program chairs of other MAP societies, we are currently working on scheduling monthly meetings from February through June. Our next meeting is scheduled for Thursday evening, October 7th, starting at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, and it, it will feature Anthony Mullen, whose picture is right now on the screen, and he recently retired from his position as a reference specialist in the Geography and Map Division of the Library of Congress. The title of his presentation, which was recently published in Terry and Con Cognite is how tourist business and colonization maps shaped North American views of Cuba, 1898 to 1913. He's had long research interest in the historical cartography of Latin America. And now you know, uh, we can show a picture of our speaker tonight. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Tonight's speaker, Andrew Rhodes, is a new member of the Board of Directors of the Washington Map Society, and the title of his presentation is James Monteith, Cartographer, Educator, and Master of the Margins. If you have questions, please type them in the chat feature, and Andy will address you with them at the end of his talk. Over to you, Andy. Okay, let me start uh, sharing my screen. All right, can I get a thumbs up that somebody can see the slides? You're okay. Okay, 
Well, great. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Thank you, John, for, for setting this up. Uh, I should just say thanks to Ron Grimm, even though he's not here for uh, asking me to do this talk. Ron is also a tremendous help um, in the course of uh, my research, uh, uh, making contacts and, uh, and reading some early drafts. Uh, and as Jeff said, if you aren't already a member, uh, uh, please consider joining uh, one of the MAP societies, um, uh, including WMS. Uh, with that, I will jump right into it. And so here is a, here is a, a little chip of the, um, the abstract of the piece that I recently published in Cartographic Perspectives. Uh, you can see the title there, uh, James Monteith, Master of the Margins. Uh, there's a link to the article there. Um, I've also put in a link to a couple other websites um, that I run, uh, in particular, uh, the mapspam.net uh, has uh, more images from my, uh, my collection of, uh, of James Monteith maps and all of some, uh, some of his contemporaries that I collected um, in the course of, uh, of my research. But I want to start the story uh, with, with this map. It's actually uh, right here behind me. Uh, it's um, kind of the start of my, my quest. Uh, and it's a, an inexpensive uh, 1885 map of, of Africa by Monteith that, that I bought uh, more than a decade ago just because I had an interest in, in maps of uh, Africa from this, this period. Uh, I'm going to come back to this particular map a couple times. And even though it's hard to see on the screen, uh, I think it's important to start um, when I'm telling a story about the margins to at least show you the full sheet so you know how it all, um, how it all comes together <clears throat> um, before I kind of dive into a lot of details. Anyway, so uh, I've had this map uh, hanging on the wall um, in my kitchen for uh, for a long time, and and just walking uh, by it every day, noticing a lot of uh, a lot of details um, in the margins, including some um, some unusual symbols in and diagrams in the margins, uh, and and seeing this little uh, name down in the corner, James Monteith. Um, and so it was kind of early uh, in the in the pandemic, as I was uh, had a little extra free time, I started asking myself. Well, who was James Monteith? Uh, and I was kind of surprised that pretty much nobody really knew um, anything beyond the you know the bare basics that he had existed. Um, and so um, I uh, I kind of found out that Monteith had kind of been forgotten, even though uh, he was a very prolific um, map maker and publisher uh, for for four decades. And in fact, he was, he was a major force uh, in geography education in um, the late nineteenth century. Um, and uh, you know his New York Times obituary said that every every school child in in uh, in America knows uh, knows the name of James Monteith because it's on the cover of their uh, their textbook. Um, so I, I unearthed with the details that I could, but I'll say a lot of the mystery is still out there. And so I put this image up. Uh, this is this is Broadway in in Manhattan in 1859 because this this was Monteith's world. Um, he was an Irish immigrant. Uh, he came to New York as a as a child, very young child. Uh, he was a lifelong New Yorker, lived his entire life in the city. Uh, he went through the New York public school system. And uh, before he turned 20, he became a, a uh, teacher in the New York public schools. Uh, so he was a teacher, he was an artist, um, and he started making his own textbooks. And he started uh, making maps in those textbooks um, in, the, uh, in the 1850s. Um, he was mentored in this pursuit um, by uh, another educator and map maker named Francis McNally. Uh, incidentally, no relation to the McNally of Rand McNally, but uh, McNally was also uh, a, a map maker uh, who was already publishing textbooks when, when Monteith kind of came on the scene. Uh, and it sort of was uh, the McNally show and then became McNally and Monteith show. And then when McNally died in 1854, Monteith really uh, came, uh, came into his own um, as, a, as a map maker map maker and, um, uh, and a publisher of geography textbooks. And uh, Monty, he became very successful, as I said, you know, uh, a, a nationwide publishing success, recognized name. Uh, he also did very well for himself by uh, investing in real estate. He was one of the um, early developers of the neighborhood that's now Washington Heights uh, in, in New York. And he became, um, became wealthy uh, in that way. Uh, until uh, he dropped out of a heart attack one day in 1890 uh, at age 59. Um, and so over the course of that career that I just mentioned, there's, there's a, a clear evolution of, of the textbooks. And I've got uh, a few of them laid out here. Um, 
And uh, he was very typical in many ways of, of contemporary uh, publishers of geography textbooks. But I think there are some, some subtle and some very interesting ways uh, where Monteith differed. Uh, and I think some of the techniques that, that made him special were actually very, were evident very early on in this, uh, this evolution. And so in the article, I, I uh, sort of generalized to say there's, there's basically four generations of, of Monteith uh, textbooks. Um, and so I sort of had, um, you know, this is what they actually look like here. Th this is one of the first generation uh, textbooks, uh, very small, uh, honestly, very, very crude uh, handmade maps um, from the 1850s. Um, then in the 1860s, what I call the second generation, uh, the maps get more sophisticated, the atlas, uh, the, yeah, I should say the textbooks become larger, and he starts to do some innovative things with comparative data uh, in the maps themselves. Um, and then in the third generation, the 1870s, these are really some of my favorites uh, because there's a real inventive and even kind of playful uh, spirit to his maps, even if they're not quite as polished and as integrated uh, as the stuff that came later. And then the fourth generation, um, you, you, you will find a lot of these available uh, you know, uh, for collecting um, because these stayed in print for, uh, for, for three decades, long after uh, his death. But starting about 1885, that's what I call the, you know, the fourth generation of, uh, of Monty, right at the end of his life. He, you know, uh, again, 1885, he dies in 1890. Uh, and, and the Africa map that hooked me is an example uh, of, that, of that fourth generation because all of the elements um, and his techniques uh, are there in that, that fourth generation. And so kind of lining up the, the chronological sequence and seeing how they changed over time is actually really fun and, and, and an interesting mystery um, but we probably don't have time just to kind of walk through all of those. What I really want to do is focus just on those, those techniques, those things that he did in the margins um, that, that bring all those elements together uh, in the fourth generation, or sometimes called his high style. Um, so, so what are those, uh, those uh, marginal elements? Um, I, I list again the generations here, and then on the uh, on the right, um, this is um, copied from the uh, from the article. Um, these are these are the marginal elements that I think uh, I will try to convince you make him the the master of the of the margins. Uh, first is comparative latitude. Um, second is comparative area symbols. Uh, third is using multiple scale bars, uh, and and fourth is uh, is terrain cross sections. Um, so I'll jump into uh, some, some examples and some details now. So this is what you saw uh, if you opened up an 1854 uh, Monteith geography textbook. Um, it's probably bigger on your screen there than, than the actual book that I just held up is. Um, and so it, it, it's kind of beautiful in, in, in how crude it is. But uh, you, when you look at it closely, you look at the borders and you, and you can see that this was hand colored with a, with a watercolor brush. Uh, but again, it's it's a simple, straightforward reference map, there, and there's nothing in the margins. Um, so, so um, but then the margins start to fill in, and let's talk about comparative latitude first, because um, indicating the comparative latitude of a distant location, particularly a distant city, uh, was fairly common in some of these late 19th century uh, maps, and so uh, the one on the far left there, that's a that's a second generation uh, Monteith map. Uh, where he's, he's showing you uh, that, that Florence, that Rome, that Lisbon um, are at the, and Cairo are at these latitudes relative to the, the, the main map. But Monteith did uh, a couple things that were different than other, um, other map makers who were using these techniques at the time. Uh, first is that he went beyond just using point symbols for, uh, for cities. Um, and he was using miniature diagrams of, of, of natural features. And you can see some interesting examples here. These are actually from a map of Maine, a, a third generation 1870s uh, map. But over in the margins, there on the left margin, there's these tiny little symbols to say, uh, well, the mouth of the, the Columbia River is at this latitude, just, just above 46 north. And um, the Straits of Mackinac are, are at this latitude. And he's actually made it look like the mouth of the river, made it look like a strait. And then in the right-hand margin, uh, uh, for Mont Blanc, um, he, he's actually drawn a, a very small, subtle um, uh, uh, mountain symbol there. Then, but the other thing uh, that I think is uh, maybe even more interesting, very more and more typical of Monteith is that he um, didn't just do 
uh, comparative latitude of points, we did a comparative um, extent. Um, so he would he would show you relative to the main map what is the um, how, how vast is a distant country or or area at the at the same latitude, uh, and he played with different forms of this. So the one I have up on the screen, uh, uh, both the full map and and a detail is is a second generation, so an 1860s map, um, and in this one. Uh, he he's trying to use the uh, he's using the horizontal margin to show uh, comparative east west extent. You know, show you this is how um, how big Long Island is relative to Britain. Uh, well, he's also trying to use the the side margins to show you the the north south comparative latitude of Siberia or or Labrador. Uh, this uh, attempt actually ends up being pretty confusing uh, because you're showing two different pieces of data in the side margins because you're showing extent and latitude whereas is in the the upper margin and the lower margin you're only showing extent and not um comparative longitude and i think that's why he actually stopped doing this uh after the 1860s <laughs> um and the the one on the right um which is, again is a detail from that africa map i showed you he he he, he stuck to only using the um uh the side margins for 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 showing distant uh regions um, terrain cross sections are another one of those elements that I think are really interesting. And again, um, uh, you see different elements of terrain cross sections throughout 19th century maps. Um, and you know the ways of depicting topography in the 19th century changed a lot. Uh, There's a lot of great experimentation as more detailed elevation data became available uh, and new techniques, especially those popularized by, by Humboldt became, uh, became more widespread. Uh, and I think Monty's career kind of overlapped with the heyday of the terrain cross section, which is a very old technique, uh, and but probably one that you, you don't really see anymore, uh, except maybe in, in like a backpacking trail guide. Um, so the black and white example there at the top is uh, 1849 from, uh, from Guyot, who, who Monteith named as one of his influences. Uh, you also see terrain cross sections like this in the McNally maps that I think Monteith inherited. Um, and then the, the one here that shows Sudan and Abyssinia on the left, that, um, that is from just you know, in the text, not on the map itself of a Monteith um, textbook in the 1870s. Uh, but then on the one on the right, the South America map uh, in, in the 1870s, you have Monteith overlaying the ter terrain cross section directly onto the map uh, and actually having, having more than one. Um, and this is actually an, on a, a map drawing exercise. Uh, which is something very common uh, again to 19th century textbooks. Um, but then by the fourth generation, um, he had settled into a pattern of, of, of detailed cross sections showing depth um, and down in the, uh, the bottom margin next to uh, an extent diagram. Uh, and with both the, the cross section and the extent diagram aligned in longitude to the adjacent map. Now, that's kind of confusing what it's explained. So we try and show you a couple examples. But if you look at the, the one at bottom here, um, you, you, have the, you have the Himalayas here at the, at, in the bottom margin of a, of a continental map of Asia. Uh, I, I like this one partly because you know, Himalayas are, are the ultimate terrain, but also the, the misalignment of the color printing here um, uh, shows you uh, how much you know, the quality could really vary uh, in these, these mass produced uh, maps. Uh, and then it also, you know, if you, uh, you know, in the news today, uh, of course, Afghanistan, you can see that that shows you on the main map, this is the east-west extent of Afghanistan, and it shows you one of the, the, the main features there of, of, of Helmand. Um, I also think it's interesting uh, just to uh, highlight uh, the latest issue of the portal on, uh, if you are a WMS uh, member, I think Emily Boak's article on, um, on mapping Afghanistan is really excellent. Uh, it has a great discussion, not only of mapping Afghanistan, but it has a discussion of um, you know, sort of oblique sketches and, and, and uh, sketching terrain very much in this way um, that I think is typical uh, of the period. And then, so just to try and be clear, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you again that Africa map um, so that you can see the way that, um, I don't know if you can see my cursor moving, but you can see here uh, the peaks of Tenerife um, down in the bottom margin are, are aligned in longitude with Tenerife. Uh, Kilimanjaro over here in East Africa is aligned with Kilimanjaro in longitude uh, in the map itself, while showing you the um, here's the east-west extent of Abyssinia on the main map. 
So the, uh, I think Monteith really likes to capture the imagination on, on terrain and topography beyond just a simple cross section. I think this is where we're getting more into what's really more unique about him um, rather than just sort of incorporating ideas others had used. Um, and for example, how do you capture the imagination of your reader about depicting uh, the, the full course of a river? Uh, and we have a, I think this is where Monty the artist um, and, and Monty the educator really come out more than sort of him as nearly as a, as a map maker. Because um, uh, if you look at the upper diagram of the, of the St. Lawrence River, uh, this is actually highly derivative of a, of a diagram that Emma Hart Willard had drawn um, early, earlier. Um, but hers was very simple. And this one is just, it's so richly detailed where there's, there's depth to it, there's distant mountains, there's clouds, you have the um, you have uh, showing the rapids, you have, um, you know, the waterfall throwing off mist, uh, and then you have the individual towns um, in the, uh, in the St. Lawrence uh, watershed, all uh, represented in a, in a, in a stylized form. Uh, and so I think it, it really brings together the artistry and uh, really makes you think in new ways about the course of that river. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, this one didn't um, make it into the article itself, uh, and this one's kind of, again, hard to display on a small screen, but um, the full extent of the Mississippi River. This is a really beautiful um, uh, piece of art if you get close to it. And I've tried to give you a little details here because it, it shows you the full course all the way from the headwaters in Minnesota coming down past every named town uh, as the Mississippi rolls down to the, rolls down to the Gulf. And I give you a little detail there of New Orleans and uh, in the Delta to show you how much detail he, he put into this. And I think uh, does give you a really uh, good sense um, uh, in some ways that a, that a, that a flat map uh, couldn't capture. Um, he did not just with rivers, but, but, but mountains and even whole continents. <clears throat> I think, uh, so he calls this sketch of, of South America a, a balloon view. Um, you know, this is something that uh, Matthew Edney and others have talked about uh, in pointing out that after the 1860s, uh, these kinds of, uh, of uh, oblique views, they called them bird's eye views at the time, even though they're kind of at an angle, um, uh, became very popular after the 1860s when, when ballooning and photography really started to change people's uh, perspectives. Um, and uh, Monteith in, in the introduction to some of the textbooks from this period was very proud. This is the only textbook of its kind that has bird's eye views of the, um, of the terrain. And this is what he was talking about. And I think doing this on a, on, on a continental scale uh, is a great work of, of imagination. And again, I think the, the small screen probably doesn't do it justice because if you look at that transcontinental view of Europe on the bottom there, uh, the original of that is actually um, 17 inches wide. Uh, it, it, when, you, when you fold out um, uh, one of the fourth generation textbooks, and there's, there's several of these for, for each continent, um, it, it ends up being 17 inches across on a single sheet. Um, with, with really great detail. And I, I blew up just the section of the Northern Adriatic here to show you just how much detail he was putting into this. Um, again, this is, this is more uh, uh, artistry than cartography uh, because he's, he's not going for uh, necessarily geographic accuracy. He's using a, an exaggerated view, a composite view to show the reader uh, a full continent of terrain all at once um, to pair this with the map, to, to bring the map to life. Uh, so next is the, the multiple scale bars. Honestly, this was the one that first hooked me on that, uh, that map of Africa. And I have a detail here uh, from, that, from that same map. Um, because uh, he's not just using scale bars to show distance the way that most people conventionally would and most map makers would. Uh, he's, he's using the legend uh, on these maps to show time. Uh, that is essentially dividing distance by speed and, and depicting time as a, uh, as a scale. Um, you know, Monty started including some individual time diagrams in, in the 1870s. Uh, then by the fourth generation, you know, the 1880s, he, he was routinely using this construction of putting three different um, uh, time scale bars uh, together uh, in the legend. Uh, you know, it makes sense for, you know, uh, a globalizing world in which, um, you know, time was money uh, to be uh, showing you what travel by steamship, what travel by rail uh, looked like. Uh, so these, uh, sort of the, the commercial map of the world was a very common uh, inclusion for, for textbooks and atlases um, of this period. But if you look really closely at this one on the right, you know, just the detail of uh, a very, uh, 
uh, large um, Mercator projection map of the world, uh, Monty's version is actually a little different. He doesn't just show you what the uh, what the route uh, uh, what the shipping route is between two ports, uh, and then label the distance. Both at sea and on land, um, the routes use dashes uh, to mark one day of travel, um, and then they and then there's a number for every fifth day. So this shows you. Uh, this how you know two days out of New York, this is where you would be. Uh, two days, uh, two days west of New York by rail, um, this is this is where you would be. Um, and I just think it's really inventive uh, and uh, kind of surprising we don't we don't see this more uh, either either then or now. So uh, this was the this was the map I gave Ron Grimm uh, for the for the opening slide, uh, and it it highlights the uh, the notion of uh, how to depict comparative area uh, in a map, um, and I think this is clearly something that uh, Monteith was interested in uh, even earlier than some of the other techniques he used. He was he was uh, uh, doing this from the 1860s, which is where um, this map comes from. Uh, and in this map, uh, he's already uh, thinking about and trying to uh, engage uh, the reader, or engage the student with understanding how a U.S. state compares in size to uh, to distant regions, regions that the you know, the student will, will will never actually go for go to and, and doesn't have any sense of. Uh, and this this map's really interesting because it's making multiple different comparisons. It's not just uh, saying, "Hey, Maine is about the same size as Scotland," for example, or saying that. Uh, Italy is about the size of Georgia and Florida put together. Um, it's also using color here um, to say, well, the, you know, the yellow region uh, is the, the same um, area equal to uh, Arabia. And so he, he does this in the 1860s and then he, and then he goes away from it. Um, and uh, he ends up um, seeing, you see more things like this uh, in the 1870s maps. Um, now this, um, uh, is mostly a uh, about uh, both map teaching map drawing and teaching comparative sizes at the at the same time, and it's in this period in the 1870s um, where he really uh, develops this uh, fixation with Kansas, uh, Kansas both as a as a guide and Kansas as a as a symbol. It's it's it like becomes the like the golden section, the golden rectangle for uh, for Monteith because it's a perfect 200 by 400 mile rectangle for him that makes it easy to remember. Uh, it, it is the key to getting the proportions right when you're when you're drawing a map. Uh, so as you see here, Florida uh, fits neatly into two upended uh, Kansases, um, whereas whereas uh, Austria is uh, is three of them. Um, uh, he also uh, gets very playful here with this comparative shapes thing um, that he's doing where he, uh, where he says, OK, well, if you want to remember how to draw Cuba, just remember that it looks like a lizard. Uh, I will say that that particular um, technique uh, only appears uh, for a few years. I think he he, he tried it out and, and and eventually realized it didn't it didn't work. Um, but what did work was this Kansas thing, um, and so he kept Kansas as as pretty much as the standard symbol uh, in all of his later textbooks. Um, uh, and as I showed you in the Africa map again, uh, here's another map. Of, uh, of Southeast Asia, where the Kansas map, again, uh, the Kansas symbol, comparative area symbol shows up again, where you can see he's marking 200 by 400 miles in the margins, giving you the area of 80,000 square miles uh, right there under the uh, scale of steamship time. Uh, I also included this one because it's kind of unique. This is a, one of the only examples where he didn't use a US state. He actually used a foreign country. Um, I think he used Netherlands because this is pretty close to the uh, Dutch East Indies. Uh, he was making a, a sort of a, a colonial point there. Um, he did try a bunch of other states as comparative symbols before he settled on Kansas. Um, he, he used California as example, um, the one on the left. Uh, he tried Louisiana. He, he, he tried combinations of using uh, Iowa and Illinois and Missouri together. Um, but eventually he just settles on, on, on Kansas. But um, this in particular has kind of become a little bit of a, a little bit of a hobby of mine to now try and find and spot um, different U.S. states uh, used as comparative area symbols. Uh, I think uh, I feel pretty confident saying that nobody did it uh, quite as much as Monteith. Nobody did it quite as enthusiastically. 
uh, as Monteith, and maybe not. I haven't really found anybody who did it earlier than Monteith. There may be somebody that he he stole the idea from, but uh, as best I can tell, he was uh, one of the first, if not the first, to do this comparative um, state symbol uh, trick, which you actually see continuing for quite a while. You can still see examples well into the 20th century of a few other cartographers um, doing it. Um, so kind of in, uh, to bring it to a conclusion and, and, and then start to get into some questions, I'll, I'll bring it back to, uh, to this Africa map. Because uh, here again, this is the one that got me started on, on Monteith. And you can see all the pieces um, come together uh, in the margins. You know, you, in the side margins, uh, you, you see the comparative latitude using both sides um, to, to show you, uh, what, you know, how extensive, how large uh, a distant area is. Um, you've got the multiple scale bars, uh, both statute miles, then you have railroad time and steamship, steamship time. Uh, you've got the, uh, the Kansas comparative area symbol. Um, I think it's also uh, worth pointing out when you look at a map like this, um, that, uh, you know, admittedly, you know, the accuracy of, of, the, of a map like this, which is, you know, the most sophisticated one uh, that he published in his lifetime, uh, the accuracy is questionable. Um, you know, the, the limits of, of a lot of these comparative techniques, uh, you know, are only useful for, for, for the general reader. Um, you know, Monteith, as best I can tell, he was self-taught. You know, he, he was started teaching, uh, I think at 19. I don't think he ever went to college. I don't think he had any formal training in, in map making. So on one hand, it's, it's, it's incredible that he produced something so sophisticated, but um, it's also true that I don't, I don't think he had the technical expertise to, to consider or to convey, uh, you know, of course, you know, the ways that distance and shape and area necessarily get, um, get distorted across the surface uh, of a map, depending on the projection. Um, you know, some of these uh, comparisons, and I, and I really do think he's kind of a master of, of, of uh, comparative geography. Um, a lot of these comparisons only work as, it really is kind of crude heuristics for the, for the generalist. But again, but that's whose imagination Monteith was trying to capture. He, he was after um, the general reader. Uh, and I, I think uh, it, it makes me think that uh, today when, you know, all of us on our desktop have access to, uh, to the technical tools and the technical ability uh, that Monteith could never have imagined. You know, all of us can make a map with uh, more accuracy than, than, than he could have. But I do wonder if we've lost something by, uh, by forgetting um, and not employing some of these, uh, that, these techniques that, um, that he used uh, you know, with, with just so much inventiveness, I think. I, you know, was a great um, uh, quote from John Walter that I, uh, that I cite in the, uh, in the article, because uh, he was writing about uh, the, the same period. Uh, and he had this great line about, um, when he says the elaborate, exuberant, and colorful ways that uh, that maps uh, were adorned, um, and you know this map that we're looking at here. It's, I mean, it's not adorned in the sense of um, sort of you know artistic um, curls around the side. It's not um, it's not surrounded by uh, by uh, Corinthian columns or anything. But it, it you know the margins are packed um, with detail, and 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 I think we sometimes. Uh, we might do well uh, to to consider um, uh, how we might return to some of Monty's uh, exuberance um, in 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 using the margins. I'm going to start around here. Um, you know, I still haven't been able to find a photograph of of Monty. I am sure that one exists somewhere uh, in in some archive in in Manhattan. Uh, I still have a lot of unanswered questions about, about him and, and his career. I've been able to find out uh, a fair bit about, uh, you know, his, his immediate family and, and his descendants. Um, but I, I, I don't know of any, you know, archive of his, uh, of his papers uh, or, or really any, any primary source materials. Uh, I, I think there, there, there are more layers to the story that are, are, are yet to be um, unwrapped. But I, I did at least find his grave site. Um, which is in, in Philadelphia in, uh, in Laurel Hill Cemetery. Uh, and it has this uh, really beautiful view uh, overlooking the Schuylkill River um, if you are ever in the Philadelphia area. Uh, and with that, I will, uh, I will take your questions. I see if there's anything in the chat yet. Uh, there are two. Um, 
Andrew, that uh, I can I can repeat. I don't know if they all went to everyone. Uh, one was from uh, John Doctor, who um, notes that the uh, fourth generation uh, geography had at the top of the cover edition for Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois. He asks, tell me more about that. Did he have multiple editions for various states? Were there different maps in the editions? He did, and that, that actually was very typical of the publishing industry at the time. Uh, actually, I think we had, we had a talk last year from Libby Bischoff, um, uh, who talked about this a little bit as well. Um, so uh, yeah, I learned a fair bit about the kind of the publishing industry from the period uh, in the course of this. And yes, yeah, so it, it was very typical. So uh, actually this, this one that I have right here is actually edition for New York. And so what you would have is um, the standard, um, you know, the standard textbook with all of its maps, but then at the back, there would be, uh, there'd be an insert. And so you'd get an insert with a detailed map of New York uh, like this. Um, and so they would, uh, have the full print run, but then they would they would do additional ones for the Midwest, for the New, for New York, for New England, um, for the South, uh, um, things like that. Um, which I mean, it, it makes it even more uh, interesting and puzzling because um, I generalized it into these four generations um, because there's there was a lot in common. But even within each of those generations, there would be major differences from one year to the next, um, depending on which edition. Um, Came out. Some of them were uh, would have more color um, pages, and some would have more black and white. Uh, tremendous variation within uh, each generation. I'll, I'll also the other thing I'll say about the fourth generation maps uh, is that all of the early ones all say Monteith on the cover. The fourth generation maps, um, uh, most of them are called Barnes's Complete Geography because uh, they were published by the A.S. Barnes Company, which around 1890 gets bought by the American Book. Uh, company. Uh, and what's interesting, from a, if you look at a lot of geography books um, from like the 1890s, and I, I bought way too many of them on eBay over the last uh, year and a half, yeah. uh, you start to notice uh, just how much overlap there is. And, and there was a lot of consolidation in the publishing industry around that period to where they were like reusing um, illustrations like clip art um, among differently branded um, geography textbook. So uh, it is a deep, deep rabbit hole. You can go down if you want to, to start collecting textbooks from this period and find all the different differences um, uh, in, with, within the additions that, uh, that, that John noticed. It, it's also, uh, if you do have interest in a particular region, uh, it is really fun and worth it to try and go collect um, an edition from that region because it will have extra um, uh, detailed maps uh, in it. Um, okay. Uh, we have one from Douglas McElroy, who asks, the state area map should be a cylindrical equal area projection. Is it? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I did spend several days at one point trying to figure out exactly which projections he was using um, for, for some of the, the standard maps. Uh, Again, I don't think he was that technically proficient, and I, I, I suspect he never made any notation on the maps themselves of the projections. And even in the introductory um, materials where he is talking about uh, the way that maps are created, um, uh, I believe the only uh, discussions are either of Mercator or of uh, polyconic uh, projections. Uh, I think several of the, the continental maps are, are polyconic, uh, which are not, which don't preserve area. Uh, and therefore, again, this whole usage of the comparative area symbol is a nice idea that's not really all that accurate um, across the, uh, the area of a map. Um, so yeah, I, I think the, the, the question of projections is a really interesting one um, uh, that I, I wish I knew more about. Um, uh, so we got, sorry, a couple, I can see the questions here, uh, Jeff. Um, did you yeah. look to see if he copied any English or German sources? Uh, he, the short answer is yes. Um, I think a lot of the, um, uh, in the article, uh, there's, there's a paragraph where I, where I uh, mentioned the specific ones that, that he at least cited. I think he probably also copied some other American map makers without crediting them. Um, but, but all of the big names, um, uh, from, from Europe, um, uh, he did copy and sort of, and then naturalized Americans like Guyot, um, and, 
and then uh, British sources like uh, Johnson, he, he did uh, copy. Uh, Stephen asks, if any of the Africa maps show the mythical mountains of Kong, yes, absolutely. Um, uh, if, you, if you're interested in um, the way that uh, Africa maps changed in the 19th century, which is one of the things that got me started, uh, uh, go out and, and, and buy up some uh, Monteith maps because you will, find, uh, you will find the mountains of Kong. I believe it's in the second generation ones. Um, you'll find the mountains of the moon um, uh, long before they were the, the Bruinsoris. Um, uh, you will find the Great Lakes on most of the Africa maps. Um, but uh, of course, between the 1860s and the 1880s, knowledge of the exact configuration of the, uh, the Great Lakes changes a lot. And you can see that reflected in Monteith, which is incidentally one of the subjects uh, that I've been following up on and trying to write something about uh, next. Uh, Paul asks, uh, was he a member of RGS or AGS? Uh, not RGS. He was inducted into the AGS. Um, I forget the exact date. It's in the article. Um, I've, I've actually found the minutes where he was voted in, but um, that is one archive that I suspect might have something. Um, but because of COVID, I've you know, been limited to electronic resources. Uh, I know he got inducted as a member, but I don't know how active uh, he was. Uh, Tom G asks, uh, why is he buried in Philadelphia? Thank you for asking that. I for, you know, it's, it's, it's one of the mysteries that I wasted a few weeks of my life on. Uh, and it's kind of interesting. Uh, so he lived his whole life in New York, um, died in New York, but his first wife was from Philadelphia and, and his first wife died fairly young. Uh, so he had three children with his first wife she was buried in Philadelphia. He then remarried uh, late in life. Uh, and when he died, uh, I assume because it was in his will or, or somebody knew his wishes, he was buried with his first wife in Philadelphia, which was her hometown. But even more interestingly is then when his second wife died, she also was buried uh, in Philadelphia. So he is buried uh, under this uh, obelisk with both his wives in Philadelphia even though he was a, uh, a lifelong New Yorker. Um, what later 20th century cartographers uh, did he influence? Uh, his continental scale oblique perspectives remind me of uh, Erwin Rice. Yes, um, uh, I didn't draw that link myself, although I think it's spot on. Uh, you know, I have a, a bit of a Richard E. Harrison um, uh, uh, affinity and uh, that's kind of what I see when I look like that balloon map of South America. I think about that, that, that oblique view of a whole continent as being Richard Eads Harrison. But, but again, he, I think, uh, Richard Eads Harrison was, was you know, very much a contemporary of and, and influenced by um, uh, Erwin Rice. If I'm, I'm sorry, I'm probably not pronouncing that correctly. Uh, okay, I think I blew through a bunch of questions really quickly. Um, that covers the ones that I have. Um, I might add one, Andrew, um, a, a little simpler in a way. Uh, and before I do that, uh, you know, can't help but admire the inventiveness and artistry, as you say, about, about this guy in the service of education. Uh, my question is uh, uh, a simple one. How did you end up getting the Africa map first? Oh, well, I, uh, I was uh, interested myself in, in some of the, the stories of the exploration of the, the Nile headwaters. I, I, I had been reading Alan Moorhead's book, uh, The White Nile. Uh, I had a particular interest in, uh, in Uganda and, and the history of mapping that area. And to be perfectly honest, I went on eBay uh, and uh, didn't have a whole lot of money, but uh, it turns out you can find uh, some Monteith maps uh, uh, very inexpensively. Um, and I, I was trying to collect different maps from before and after the, the mapping of the, of the Great Lakes. Uh, and, and again, I, I had it on my wall for, for 10 years, just walking by it um, and seeing this name down in the corner. It wasn't until COVID that it, I, I got around to trying to figure out who really was James Monteith. And uh, it ended up being a pretty fun, uh, fun mystery to try to solve. Great. Um, well, give it a few seconds for people to consider. Uh, 
afterwards, uh, with your uh, permission, we'll keep keep it open for a little while for socializing. You can be with us, or you can uh, have a nice evening, rest of evening. Uh, Andrew, thank you so much. One thing that we do in the MAP Society, as you probably know, is uh, have a gift for uh, our speakers. Um, uh, Ron uh, Grimm uh, promised me and now is promising you that he will convey that gift to you when he returns to this part of the country. So thank you, uh, Andrew, uh, for that marvelous um, uh, presentation. Thank you, Jeff. Do you know of 18th century examples of uh, marginalia like this? I don't. Um, uh, you know, I, I went back as, as far as I could and, uh, you know, looked for examples of, um, you know, both direct and, and indirect uh, influences um, and, uh, you know, kind of trying to solve uh, or, or get to a more authoritative judgment that some of these things that he did, uh, that he was actually uh, the first or, or, or the first to put a couple of them together. Uh, I, I haven't found them. Uh, you know, some things like the terrain cross section, you, you can you can go back to um, you know, all the back to like ancient Egypt, but but to see it included directly in the margin, then integrated with the with the adjacent map, I think um, it's one of those uh, examples where it's um, um, you know, it's more than the sum of all its parts because it's really packing in the margin and putting it all together. Um, that 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 is so inventive and, and compelling. There were some 18th century nautical maps that showed uh, the entrances of harbors. In profile, <clears throat> and uh, that's one example of something similar. So yeah, actually, so um, I believe it is. Is it? Um, I think it. I'm not sure if it was John Walter or um, one of the other. Uh, it was one of the other references that uh, uh, Ron Grimm pointed me to. Um, the, yes, so in the 18th century, one example again of, of showing that uh, that cross section view. Uh, is is harbor entrances, and I think specifically 18th century um, Royal Navy uh, charting of different uh, uh, different harbors is something that you would find on on um, on nautical charts. But um, again, as an aid in navigation, not as something that's trying to pair with the the map itself. But but yes, a clear example of of using that uh, you know oblique side view of uh, of terrain. And you can even find a little bit of that in the in the 17th century as well, uh, but not integrated well with the map as far as I know, but with the idea of providing guidance for harbor entrance. Andrew, right, well, thanks, thanks everybody for showing up. <laughs> yeah, you're getting a lot of, uh, of uh, the um, Zoom equivalent of likes in the chat. <laughs> so, uh, and thank you very much. A very uh, uh, unusual team uh, on an unusual guy. Thanks, Andrew. Good talk. Appreciate it very much. Thank you, Andrew.